Okay, everybody, this is it. This is the big closing keynote I put on my white jacket to commemorate the event. This is Will Reynolds. You know Will Reynolds. You may know him from Real Company Shit. Uh, you may know him from his work at Power BI, uh, the Sear Agency, one of the best companies you know, on the East Coast and the West Coast too, making differences, not only in the SEO and PPC world, but in their community. Just an awesome all around great company and a great guy. Uh, he's also one of the most honest people in the industry. And that's why we always enjoy him. Uh, let's welcome Will Reynolds. Howdy folks, Will Reynolds here from Sear Interactive. And as you know, I like to study disruption within marketing. And this time I'm starting with the CMO and realizing some of the pressures that they're under, what their goals and objectives are, and ultimately how can we use the data that we already have at our fingertips to solve the CMOs of the future's biggest problems. Because I've been looking for a while at what drives success for CMOs versus failure. And I don't have time to get into all the failures today. But when I look at the studies done around CMOs of the top 2,500 companies in the United States, they're seeing that things like customer data and analytics, but not just having customer data and analytics, it's knowing how to use that data to make better decisions. Then we see here the enterprise-wide business mindset, and we also see voice of the customer at the leadership table, with voice of the customer being their number one goal. And I think that we, as search professionals, content marketers and marketers that deal with search, I think we've got a really good chance to own the customer journey. Because I think that we get more information about the customer journey than pretty much anybody else does. I just don't think that we're using that data that we're already getting all that efficiently. So let's start with a story. Once upon a time, there was a CEO. And the CEO said this. Do you all know that 2020 marks the 130 year anniversary of this quote? 130 years ago, this was a problem that CEOs had about marketing. And you know what? When we think about our role in, in understanding the customer and the customer journey, I will tell you that part of what leads to that inefficiency in spend on marketing is the fact that we're spraying broader than we need to to target our customers. And I will tell you, the less you understand your customer, the more you are going to have to spend to acquire that customer. But it's all good now, right? 130 years ago, they didn't have Google Analytics. I'll tell you. Having Google Analytics is a lot like having data. It's not necessarily knowing what to do with it. Why? Because I do a lot of analysis on inefficiency and marketing spends. And I will tell you that while it may not be 50% 130 years later with all these cool tools, it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't 30. And that's not a lot of progress. See, because so often when we say, well, we've got analytics. I'm like, yeah, but analytics is a lot like being punched in the face. Don't you wish you know that guy was gonna throw that punch 30 seconds earlier? Analytics is so often a tool that you know you check it once a week or you look for certain things and by the time you finally look at it, you realize I've been getting punched in the face for the last three weeks and my analytics is just now telling me that it's a problem. In this current environment, more than ever, I would say every dollar is under an extreme amount of scrutiny right now, which means CMOs are being asked tougher and tougher questions than ever, and those questions roll down to us. So what are we going to do to help CMOs in this current state of affairs? But actually, this has nothing to do with COVID. Things were already looking pretty bad for the CMO when, it looks, when we look at the C-suite. There are articles around why CMOs are always the first ones to be fired when business objectives aren't hit. Large companies are leading the charge to completely get rid of the CMO role. And they're oftentimes replacing it with a chief growth officer or someone else, but they're getting rid of the role. They're reevaluating the role. And some of these companies are starting to say, whoops, we made a mistake. But still, the CEOs were thinking, I don't know if I need that CMO anymore. And you can see Gap hires a CMO, gone in 11 months. They redefine the role. Lyft, eight months. 
gone. We shaked up the marketing department. It's like, man, we constantly have these arrows in our backs as marketers. And if the people who write the checks to us to do marketing for their organizations are these folks, then how can we help them look more like those successful CMOs that we've seen? Because every single study that I've looked at shows the data that the CMOs have the shortest tenure in the C-suite. Whew. All right. So there's a little bit of a power play here. Let's just break it down in the role of the CMO. If data is how successful CMOs operate, well, CIOs are the one that own that data for them to get. CFOs are the ones who approve their budgets. And CEOs are the ones who hire them and choose who to pay and how much to pay them. So the CMO, while in the C-suite, is really at the mercy of so many other people to be successful in the role. And so often, if they don't all work together, we get the blame and we're the ones who are fired first. So I have the ear of some CMOs. And you know, you kind of think, way well, great, I've got the ear of the CMO, but there's a, there's a new sheriff in town. And remember what I just said, the CMO is always at the whims of the CEO, CIO, and CFO because they own the strings to help marketers to do their jobs. And this guy has a chance to disrupt that even further because he's got the ear of the CEO, the CIO, and the CFO. And remember, they got the puppet strings oftentimes in many organizations over the CMO. And he is really good at translating and building solutions that help us to take marketing speak into the language of the CEO, CIO, and CFO. Now think about your job. How easy is it for somebody to connect your work into the language of a CEO, a CIO, or a CFO? And if you're not doing that, then you're not setting up your CMO or your marketing leadership to easily translate your work into the way that they look at the business. I will tell you that that person is Brian Whipple, CEO of Accenture Interactive, whom we are now starting to compete with on SEO. So when, the first time I heard a client say, hey, you know, we're looking at Accenture to do our, uh, Accenture Interactive to do our SEO, and I have so much respect for Brian, um, so much. Um, so I Googled it. I Googled Accenture Interactive SEO, and I look at the first result, and it's a Philippines site. And I'm like, man, their href lang is off. And then the second result is an old piece of content. And the third result is a PDF. I mean, oh, okay. And then I looked at Deloitte, who's also starting to offer SEO uh, services and coming into our space. And I'm like, their Malta site ranks number one, two. And then Glassdoor, they don't even have regular content that's, that, that's ranking appropriately to talk about their service offering. Now, I think a lot of us who do search in the, in the room, we're kind of laughing at these guys a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> They're going to do SEO. They can't even get their href lang right. Well, let me remind you, I've never seen the word href lang in a quarterly report from a CFO or CEO. Do not think that these guys are not going to come and be in our boardrooms having conversations right next to us. Why? Because they've done it before. The Omnicoms, the Publices, the IPGs and Densus of the world really kind of fought against these guys. Sorry for the pixelated slide. I couldn't get this one uh, correct. Um, but then in a matter of just a few years, they went from, they don't do what we do to, oh my God, they're taking my customers. These guys know how to move fast because they have the ears of the CEOs, CIOs, and CFOs and organizations. So now I need to understand how does Brian Whipple talk? Listen to the things that he's saying, look at this quote and think that is what is making CEOs who are over marketing, CIOs who are often needed for marketers to be more data driven, and CFOs who approve the budgets. This is what he's saying to them and getting their buy in over our points of contact. Okay. Now you might be thinking, well, well, consultancies, you're worried about that because that's your competitive world. But it's like, no, 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 no. If you're in house somewhere, you have a CEO, a CFO, a CIO, and a CMO, and these dynamics are happening there too. So how do you set up your in-house chief marketing officer, chief growth officer to be speaking the language of the CEO and CFO and CIO? Because the result, if we continue to take our information and not pivot it and turn it into a way that works for those folks in the C-suite, well, we saw what happened already. 
the Accentures, Deloitte's, Cognizant, and IBM's did acquisitions, came into the space, and are now making the people who owned marketing for sometimes 50, 60, 80, hundreds of years, they're making them sweat and they're taking their business. You know, next time somebody starts talking about buzzword bingo about your CEO, CFO, or CIO, tell them to shut up. Because if this is the language they're speaking and we want to change their minds, then maybe we should also be speaking their language as well. We do not want to be the translator who only speaks one language. If the language you speak is only SEO and it's not the same language as the CFO, then you're going to make it harder to get SEO work done. Because I'll tell you this, I don't know a whole lot of CEOs who read search engine land, but they're the ones who write our checks. Zilts. Zero. None of them. They don't read it. Sorry. Which is why on our site, we've got a couple of resources where we talk about how to use the reports where the CFO and CEOs talk to Wall Street because that's how they keep their jobs and how we can translate our digital marketing efforts, whether it's this post or this one on how to use financial statements to help you do SEO. We're sharing that information with you because we think it's so critical for us to be a part of helping people to speak the language of the C-suite so we can get the respect that we deserve at the table. And remember, sometimes SEO divisions, and I wrote about this in a blog post, are better run by people who aren't in SEO. So here's Crystal, Larry and me tucked off on the right. And here's our SEO revenue over some time period. And you can see what happened to the company. We started flattening out as me, an SEO guy, was running the SEO division. The people who come in with their backgrounds in, with their MBAs and their understanding of business took our SEO division to levels that I never could on my own as a day-to-day -day practitioner because I still needed a little bit of practice on speaking the language of the C-suite and it was natural for them. Here's one SEO guy I just respect the hell out of, Stefan Bajayo, and he said this, and that's hard, that's hard to read, guys. Like, the worst thing? But I think he's right. But I'm gonna show you in this presentation how to overcome that issue. So let's start the process of saying, okay, Will, you set it up, I get it. There's different language out there. How do we do that? What does that look like and feel like? Well, first thing I wanna do is remind you of the amount of clues that we have every day at our disposal to better understand customers. I search for the word transmission. Take a look. I could say, oh, you rank for the map pack and be done my job. Oh, you rank in organic and be done my job. Or, oh, a snippet shows up. But there's a lot more information here. There's not just that a map shows up, but it's the position that the map shows up. If a map is in the first position, then Google feels really confident that this is a local-based search. If it's in the 10th position, they feel less confident. That data point's important. Then I wanna be able to understand the distance from where I searched to all those locations so I can understand where does my client need to locate their new, their new offices or their new um, stores. If people showing up and searching on Google is important to them, then I need to be able to calculate from a zip code to these locations to see what's possible. And then there's reviews there and there's words in those reviews, which will give you clues to what people think about these different organizations. And then below that, we've got the people also ask questions. And think about all the data sitting in the people also ask. You've got the question itself. You've got the answer. You've got a date in this one, which tells you freshness of content. You've got the domain, which is car brain, and you've got the URL. This helps you to get, look at all those clues sitting there to potentially be harvested to better understand the voice of the customer. You search for the word transmission. Below the map and below the people also ask, you've got software, information sites, definitions, dictionary.com, Wikipedia. You've got a piece of content in here that's related to COVID. I bet you you weren't thinking COVID when I said the word transmission. And then there's stores and retail below. And yeah, COVID, because for a while, the CDC was at the top of the second page or the bottom of the first page. Thank you, Amy, for that one, uh, for the word transmission. So let's think about something else that's going on here. In order for us to understand the voice of the customer, that means that we need to also be consistently monitoring how these things are changing over time because we live in such a fluid environment. 
And my belief is whether it's a thousand keywords or a million keywords, whoops, whether it's a thousand keywords or a million keywords, it doesn't matter. We can no longer track 100 or 200 or 300 keywords and think we've done our jobs. We need to evaluate all those different clues at scale because we are not clueless. If you were to look at any other marketing channel out there, I honestly believe that if you can harvest all those clues, we're actually clue full. But we don't always have the tools to take those clues and turn them into better customer experiences. And if you're thinking customer experience, ah, remember, the people selling to CEOs, CIOs, and CFOs, and the successful CMOs are all talking about customer experiences these days. And we need to make sure that we're constantly challenging ourselves to say, how am I connecting this work that I'm doing right now to customer experience? For instance, when I just showed that a uh, Malta site ranks for Deloitte, the goal isn't to say that's wrong for HREF Lang, it's to talk about the customer experience. Are they getting the wrong language? Will they not be able to complete their tasks? Will you not be able to analyze the impact of the work that you're doing? Yada, yada, yada. We have to get our data out of these inefficient silos. But let's talk about the coronavirus a bit. Coronavirus comes and the world changed for almost every marketer out there. We had CMOs who were like, oh my God, my new reality is my CFO for the US region just said I have to cut my budget by 24% next week. And there's panic because then my CMOs go in, I got two days to figure out what I'm gonna do. Panic. So what we did is we worked with uh, one of our clients and we started brainstorming and saying, okay, what can we do to help you here with the data that we have? And we said, okay, if you're already paying for clicks and paid and you are ranking in SEO in the top three positions, you might be able to get some of that traffic for free. But if you're not in the top positions, you might need to keep paying to get those conversions because you have no way of capturing that user. So let me give you a little bit of a peek into the system that we built because I didn't want to build that system for one client and show my team how each person now needs to download some CSVs and then open up sheets and then transform the data and then you know use this plugin, that plugin. I didn't want my team members spending time doing that. I wanted them to open the file and get the answer. So we engineered the data in BigQuery to say bring in every search term, we've been doing this now for years, to bring in every search term out of PPC every day. We then run the ranking analysis on that every day so we can get the rank and we're doing this for every client. So what that means is, here's the file, it's live, where I just said, show me the rank between one and three where my client's gotten at least one conversion. And over to the left-hand side here, you can see that 20.56% of every dime that every client who trusts us to spend money on their behalf on paid is spent on keywords that fit that criteria. And then on the left side, where you see I have a client name, I have each individual client and what percentage of their spend are on keywords where they rank between one and three. So you can see that top client has a 59% of all their search of all their search spend on paid were on keywords where they already rank in the top three. So if their CFO comes in and says, you gotta get me that answer in two days and I need you to cut 24%, they know they're safe. That same CFO, if you're the client at the bottom at 13.26%, we gotta go find an, another 11% for you. And this is what it sounds like. Hey client, you spent this much on these many words that have converted, where you organically rank in the top three, and that represents X of your budget. And if that number X is over what you've just been asked to cut, we're done, right? Our work here is done. Or we found other things for clients where we said, hey, let's run an analysis across every client, where we say, where have they spent money on a keyword that's gotten over 20 clicks? So it's gotten enough action now that if it's not converting yet, maybe it's not gonna ever convert. Where they already do rank in the top 10, so they still have some visibility. And then the ability to say, hey, that's this percentage of your budget, helped our clients to know instantly where they might need to, where they might be able to make cuts without hurting their overall business. And we did that for every client in two days because we had built a highly efficient data flywheel that enabled us to hypothesize and jump instantly into action. And we wrote a blog post about it. And our system is so efficient right now that if anybody watching this today said, Will, I want that, literally from the time you give us the access 
in 48 hours, we could turn around and have that done for you because the system is so efficient. I mean, it would literally run in minutes. It just might take us a couple of days to do the analysis and get it back to you. So when my clients are thinking, oh man, Will, when that second wave comes, I'm, if I get asked to make cuts, it's like, whoa, when that second wave comes, all I got to do is we've already done the hard work. So we've already built the infrastructure underneath. So all I've got to do is hit refresh on the file that I already have built. One click will update for every client, every data point you saw to help us help them through that tough time of how they make cuts. Because see, as you start to go and understand your customer and understand their experience, when you find one-off things, I get impatient when I find one-off smarts in my organization. And I go, how can I scale this so every single client can find this kind of thing if it exists in their data with one click on a refresh button? Let me give you an example. So we were doing an analysis of the words that people were using pre and post COVID and looking at the impressions, impression growth over time. And one of the things that we found, COVID hits, people were very, 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 very worried about the FDIC. We haven't seen a spike like this since the 2008 financial crisis. So what this tells me is for a period of time, there was a significant amount of people who were worried about the safety of their money for the FDIC. So if you're a bank and you're going after banking keywords, maybe for that two week stretch or so, it would have been better to communicate to people or add into your communication around how safe you are, not necessarily how high your rates are because there's a good chunk of the audience and a good chunk of your customers at the time might have been worried more about the safety of their money than that return. And what we have here is an analysis that we are now running currently for every client where we're able to say, look at the different engrams, the different word pieces. And I can see, for instance, that anatomy is getting a lot more impressions, but woo, we're not converting those people as well. That's a different strategy. So I wanna be able to say to our clients instantly, hey, this word, people are searching for, or people are searching for that word more. And what does that tell us about how we might need to tweak the customer experience to better match these new concerns that are showing up more and more? We did this for one client and I already had the highly efficient system and the right team. And God knows I got a great team who were able to spring into action and within a matter of weeks built this out so that we could do this for every client. That's what it feels like when you've got a data flywheel at the ready that cuts through all these words and helps you to better understand your customers. See, we're already getting these clues, guys. They just exist in these silos. It's our job to take the data that everybody else has, just like you and I. You got paid data. You got scraped data from, from rankings. I got the same thing. But we're transforming it and making it accessible and translating it into value for our folks in the C-suite. Because every time you get a ranking for a word like SEO in your rank software, guess what? You're also getting all the other clues as well. And the question is, are you ignoring these clues? If you look at the word SEO company, it makes sense to bid on that word. Yes, it does. I'm an SEO company. I should bid on the word SEO company. But there's a big clue in organic in the first spot that tells you that people want local. So if you are a company in Utah and you're bidding on the word SEO company, Google's learning has already taught us that people want local more than likely. So you might want to change your bid strategy based on what Google's already learned about the customer, which is the average person searching for SEO company wants a local solution. Google's already learned it. We just have to transform our marketing to take advantage of it. And you see this concept of just getting more data in and saying that, oh, the more data I get, I can make better decisions is not true. There's a massive roadblock between these things. And it's interpreting that data to turn it into actual better decisions. We get enough data, don't we? With all these freaking tools that we have at our availability. We need to find a way to make these things all work better together. And keep in mind, this isn't just about getting me more data. It's about transforming and translating that exact same data into value for the C-suite. Because remember, the other thing that successful CMOs, the CMOs who are holding on to their jobs longer than their cohort, they're strong at being the voice of the customer at the leadership table. Because you know what? A CIO doesn't know what the customer wants all the time. 
A CFO, that's not really their thing. So we need to double down on helping the successful CMOs and chief growth officers at our companies be a stronger and stronger advocate for the customer by tearing through our data and saying, hey, there's clues that Google's learned. How can I use those clues to better understand what our customers are seeking? So let's talk about a few customer journeys. Let's take the word joint. Now I want you to stop and think about the word joint. Come up with what you think that word could mean. And now let's go through a journey together. I was staying at this low class joint. The bed was hard as a rock, so now my joints hurt. I had softer beds when I was locked up in the joint. My day got even worse when my wife served me papers for joint custody. I would just love a good joint recipe because man, I need a good meal right now and a joint to relax. Now look at all the different meanings of the word joint. And I think this one example will give you a feel for how the word joint can have a lot of different meanings. And who knows the meanings of those words in context better than anyone else on the planet? Google does. So when I add the word joint in front of checking account, Google knows exactly what the right answer is. Now I want you, all you smart marketers out there, to stop and think, okay, I'm at a bank and I'm doing marketing for our checking account. And somebody says, well, what's the best result for joint checking account? Think about what you would, the, the page you would build to talk to that customer and give them the best experience possible. And now I'm gonna click on Citibank, Citizens Bank, and Fulton Bank. Ready? Let's go show these old school marketers who don't have data flywheels. They got gears, but they're old, crusty, and rusty. Here's Citibank. Now, I want you to go back to what you were just thinking about joint checking accounts and how to market a joint checking account. Now look at the text, look at the fact there's only singular person here. Citizens Bank, they actually have a page that ranks number five organically for the word joint bank accounts but they're showing this page in their paid because they have siloed, crusty, rusty gears. This page doesn't say anything about joint checking accounts and they've already done the hard work to build a page that earned the ranking organically. And here's the page we're driving people to. Customer experience wise, I think we're a bit off folks. Don't you think so? And then let's look at Fulton Bank. And none of these banks mentioned the word joint on the page. They didn't mention the word joint at all. They're not speaking their customer's language. When is it a good marketing idea to not speak the language of your customer? And these are the kind of things that CMOs are under pressure on because a CEO randomly searches for this, finds it and goes, how is it that we're not doing this? A CIO goes, how are you not using all that data I've been giving you to fix this problem? And how big of a problem is it? And how often is this happening? And CMO is going to go, I have no idea. They're going to talk to them, hopefully. They're not hopefully going to not talk to them about match types. But they're going to ask somebody, just like us, why this has happened. And what's going to be our answer? And I'm not going to even show you the other three sites who have the exact same problem. And mind you, these clicks are 12, 13, 14 bucks. Why spend money to piss your customer off? It makes no sense. Why would you spend money? to send somebody to a page that has no chance of actually solving their problem or speaking their language. But one marketer, my friends, seems to have some pretty efficient gearing going on, and it's simple. Look at this page. Is this the kind of page you thought you might build for the word joint checking account? Because it's the kind of page I would have built. It shows two people, because we know what we mean when we say joint checking account. It uses words like share, and yours, mine, and ours. And the next image is also of a couple. They talk about together and shared. And look how often they use the word together. Together means the two of you, together. And then there's a picture of two lovely people on the beach on vacation, together. Hmm. Who do you think is proving that they best understand the customer and that they've got a, a, an ability to understand that the word joint in front of checking account makes the word mean something different and they're able to execute and react to it. Who do you think has the strongest flywheel? If you were a marketer and you said, okay, I can hire a marketer from any of those companies or their, their agencies, who would you pick? Who seems to have figured something out that everybody else hasn't? 
And that, my friends, is what I consistently show you on this stage at MozCon for the last few years. All right, so now let's think of another customer journey. I recently got this ad on Instagram. Instagram is a mobile platform. Yes, right. We all know Instagram's a mobile platform. So I'm looking at this ad and I'm going, holy smokes. I've never been to their website before. And these are my actual shoes. They are really good at targeting me on social. And I bet you somewhere the team who's behind showing ads to me that are the exact shoes that I have, they're like, oh yeah. If you're at Facebook or you're the targeting vendor or you're the social person or the social team at Nordstrom, you're like, our stuff is so good that we can target people with the shoes they're currently wearing. High freaking five. Not so quick because this is a very efficient gear on social, but everything else around them is old, crusty, and rusty. The page wasn't even mobile friendly. How can you drive somebody on an ad from Instagram to a landing page that's not mobile friendly? Instagram is a mobile platform. When's the last time you checked Instagram on your desktop? Right. And what hurt me even more is they only had a size 10 and a half. As you can see, when you look at the sizes, everything else was sold to freak out. Man, uh, now if I did wear a 10 and a half, I'd have been like, oh, okay, maybe. Um, but no, this is a great example of an inefficient set of gears. One really bright, shiny, awesome gear connected to a bunch of old, crusty, and rusty gears. And your customer is like, what kind of shit is that? Like, what is that? Like, how, how did this happen? <laughs> I wanted those shoes. And now, if you showed me those shoes, and I love those shoes, and you make the experience hard, and you don't have my size, you just paid for me to go find that product somewhere else for somebody who didn't have to pay. So now I'm going to Zappos. Thank you, Nordstrom, for paying for Zappos' conversions. This is where we need to adopt an enterprise-wide business mindset. How do we get the data across the enterprise, bring it together, and make all these, all these gears come together and work together? Because if you break down this problem, there's a way this could be solved at scale. You take every Instagram ad and you get all the URLs that you're driving people to. That data exists. You run those URLs through a tool or an API that can check to see if it's mobile friendly. And you do this at scale every day. And then you say, I'm gonna take the images in my ads and run an image lookup via an API to my product database so I can make sure that I can then pull the inventory for that product. So now you've got an efficient flywheel that says, I'm checking to make sure my pages are mobile friendly. I'm looking at, the, at the, the product that I'm targeting that person in that ad. I'm then looking that product up against my own inventory to see if I actually have a high enough stock to keep advertising or maybe I could shut it off. That, my friends, is how we get out of 50% of my advertising is wasted. You build the efficient systems to protect those budgets. And that's why we can't just rely purely on this, using the same tools. You know, many of us out there have a client in a space where we compete with each other. And I'm always thinking, where can I take data from tools that we all have and pivot them, turn them in a new way and get us and our clients that information faster so their flywheel is going faster than ever. If you don't have this, it's gonna be hard to compete with somebody who built a system to find the things that you can only check once a month or once a quarter. Let me give you another customer journey before I wrap up. Let's take the word enterprise customer support. And I wanna show you the journey, it's not so much a customer journey, it's a journey through siloed data sets and how we can be better. And this is what I've been talking about on stage forever. So if I take this word enterprise customer support and I take it to my SEO team, if they gotta make a decision on whether or not to go after that word, they're gonna look at monthly search volume. And they're gonna go, eh, that volume's low, skip it. 50 searchers a month, skip it. But if I can combine my SEO gear and my PPC gear in an efficient way, I will now be able to say, wait a second, my PPC data is saying, excuse me, my PPC data is saying, that word drives some conversions. So while the volume is low, it seems to drive us some people who pay our checks at this company. 
maybe, just maybe we should target it because now I've got new data, which are, is that word converting or not in paid? But we're not done yet. There's analytics. And what you and I know about analytics is very often analytics will have multiple other goals in there. So let's just say now I'm taking my MSV from SEO, whether or not that keyword converts from PPC. And I'm also saying, wait, does that keyword land people on a page that is highly likely to lead them to subscribing for emails or signing up for webinars, which I might see as highly valuable as well, because maybe I've got a great way of getting people from webinars and email into becoming customers. So now you can see that the siloed SEO was like, nope. SEO PPC together was like, maybe. SEO PPC analytics data together goes, this is looking even stronger, but this is not the holy grail, my friends. The holy grail that I'm working towards, because I already have my SEO PPC and analytics data connected this way. The holy grail is for me to get buy-in for my clients to give us their CRM data, not their customer data, but I want to be able to push data into their CRM. So in this instance, you could say, wait a second, enterprise customer support. Yes, monthly search volume was low, but it did convert a good bit. So we had a couple conversions this year on that word. And then my analytics goes, wait a second, I'm adding data in too to that word to let you know that that word and the page that those people land on, it does a good job of driving us email subscribers. But the holy grail, my friends, is the CRM. Could you imagine if you could say, wait a second, SEO, we're going after this word because I now know that we've got three deals that have closed in my CRM on this keyword as a result of targeting it in paid. So if I know that those are highly valuable customers, why would I not want to go after this word? And imagine if you took every word and ran it through these four things every day with just a refresh. Imagine the decisions you could make and how much quickly, how much more quickly you could find opportunity to help your clients, your bosses, et cetera, take advantage of these opportunities before anybody else is even thinking about it. And that, my friends, is the power of the flywheel. So just maybe, maybe the best thing that happened to search data is that it did end up in our hands. Maybe we just didn't know what to do with it. And maybe I've been showing you on this stage at MozCon for the last three or four years now, how to, actually it's probably been six years that I've been talking about listening to customers using data. Maybe this is the year that you decide to do it. And I'm gonna leave you with a story about the difference between an architect and a builder. I'm currently working with an architect. And what he says to me is he goes, Will, life's not all about vacations. What makes you fight? Everybody gets along on vacation, but that's only seven days a year, 14 days a year. All the other days of the year, you're at home with your significant other. And he says to me, what makes you fight? We're not looking at houses yet or examples or flooring. He says, what makes you and your wife fight? What gets on your nerves about each other? And, you know, I tell him a couple things that are going to stay between me and my wife because you don't need to know. And then he says, what makes you smile? And I go, oh, man, it's seeing my sister pushing my kids on a seesaw or hanging out and watching my kids just play together and grow together. And it's just so meaningful to me to just be able sometimes to catch that little peak of them being kind to each other for a couple seconds. This is what he talked to me about. He didn't talk to me about the flooring which is our version of the keyword or the href lang. He talked about my dreams and what makes me smile. And he said, I'm gonna eventually build you a house that minimizes the things that upset you about the relationship with your wife and maximizes your smiles. He said, I'm gonna build you a house with a courtyard. This is not my house. But he said, I'm gonna build you a house with a courtyard and I'm gonna make every room face the courtyard. Your office will face the courtyard. Your bedroom will face the courtyard. Your kitchen will face the courtyard. Your living room will face the courtyard. And he goes, why? Because your kids are going to spend time out there playing. And I want you to be able to see your kids, even if you're working, I want you to be able to lean over to the right a little bit, look around your monitor, and always be able to see your kids if they're out there playing. And he tapped into my dream, right? And he also said, like, hey, if you think your wife keeps a sloppy closet, how about I build your walk-in to where you walk into your closet first and hers is actually behind you or so you never see her mess. And I was like, we're going to stay together because of this guy. <laughs> but he attached to my why and he understood that my language wasn't about the flooring just yet. Eventually it is going to be about flooring, but it was about the dream, which is to keep 
to keep us married and to help us to easily always see our kids growing up together. Now, there's another person working on my project right now, and this is how this person looks at their job. I come to the site, I lay bricks for some tech dude that does conferences. That was how they see their job. The problem with not seeing the bigger picture of where you fit in the larger ecosystem around the customer experience and dream is this. If you wake up every day to lay bricks and you're 50, you'll be all right. If you're 25, this machine's coming for you. And then what are you gonna do? That's why it's so important for you to connect to the why of the customer and use that same search data to connect to their why. I think this is my eighth or ninth straight MozCon. And I just wanna remind all of you that there's an architect inside of each of you. But many of you have that architect hiding behind a bricklayer mentality. You have all the tools at your disposal. You get ranking results. You can look at all the titles and descriptions of things that are ranking. You can see the transmission just changed. You get that paid data, join it to your SEO data, which I showed you all how to do three years ago. You have the tools to be architects. I just can't wait to see all of you take advantage of those tools. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Will Reynolds. Hang in there and hopefully I'll see you next year. Have a great rest of your MozCon. Take care.